Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. <clears throat> Joining us this evening is my, Mr. Michael Bloomberg. Mr. Bloomberg attended John Hopkins University and Harvard Business School before its beginning an entry-level job with the Wall Street firm Salomon Brothers. When Salomon was acquired in 1981, he was let go from the firm and launched a small startup in a one-room office. Today, Bloomberg LP has more than 19,000 employees in more than 176 locations around the world. Mr. Bloomberg served as mayor of New York City from 2002 through 2013, then returned to the company he founded while also devoting more time to philanthropy. Today, Bloomberg Philanthropies employs a unique data-driven approach to global change that grows out of Mr. Bloomberg's experiences as an entrepreneur and mayor and focuses on five areas, public health, arts and culture, the environment, education, and government innovation. With his most recent, recent gift to John Hopkins, $1.8 billion entirely for student financial aid, he has given away more than $8 billion to phil philanthropic causes here in the U.S. and around the world. He also serves as the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for Climate Action. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Michael Bloomberg. Thanks, Rob. Rob, thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. I don't think I've ever been to an event before where so many people dress the same. <laughs> Took a while. Um, Midshipman German, thank you very much, and I will do my best to give a good speech because I don't want to get put on restriction. I did just get back from my first YP cruise, and I can only tell you that they didn't hit anything and the boat didn't sink, so I guess it was a success. But uh, I can tell you this, it is cold out there. How's everyone doing? Well, it is an honor to speak to you and to be part of this celebrated lecture series, or some of you in the brigade might call it mandatory fun. I actually thought that was funnier than you did. Uh, when Vice Admiral Carter invited me to speak, I was only glad to accept, but I also told him that I really wanted to find out what it feels like to really be a midshipman, what it means to be part of this proud, honorable, dignified history that has unfolded on this campus. So as soon as I got here, I went straight to the Herndon Monument, took off my shirt, and climbed to the top. I won't tell you how long it took me, but I will say it was helpful the monument wasn't covered in lard. <laughs> then I went to Tea Court and painted the statue of Tecumseh. I tossed a couple of pennies into his quiver just for good look, and I told the Vice Admiral, maybe if I can come back on Friday, we can go to DTA and hit the dance floor at Buddy's. If all of you can go to Buddy's at the same time, it must be a pretty big dance floor. <laughs> For all of you non-midshipmen, DTA is downtown Annapolis, and Buddy's is, well, you'll have to ask the middies to give you the gouge. <laughs> First, I should say, I am honored to follow in the footsteps of so many distinguished speakers who have addressed the brigade at three, three lectures over the, these lectures over the years, and that includes the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, a great guy who we're lucky to have on the board of my foundation, Bloomberg Philanthropies. So I'm with an admiral, I don't know, once every two weeks, probably more than most of you are. It also includes another leg legendary alumnus of the Naval Academy who we lost this year, my good friend and a true American hero, John McCain. It was one of the honors of my life to serve as a pallbearer at his funeral, and earlier today I went and visited his grave. He was never a four-star like his father or grandfather, but he was as great an American as we have ever had in this country. And I just want you to remember him. He is as much a role model as 
you need for the rest of your life. John McCain was the real McCoy, and I'm honored to have been a friend of his. One of the things I always loved about Senator McCain was his spirit of independence. I was lucky enough to have him campaign for me in the streets of Brooklyn during my first run for mayor, and almost, when no, almost nobody else would support me or thought I could win. John had the courage of his convictions, and he was never afraid to work with people on the other side of the aisle. And I think we had that in common. There's something else that we had in common, and that was our academic records. Let's just say that both of us were the kind of students that made the top half of the class possible. Uh, the bottom half's applauding. I heard that when John was a student here, he marched so many tours that could, he could have walked to Baltimore and back three times. As for me, I went to Johns Hopkins and performed quite consistently. I was a straight C student. I don't know if, yes, thank you. I don't know if I qualified as a bro, but I certainly was not a Joe. I thought you'd know that. Now, I know that there are some delegates here today from my alma mater. Johns Hopkins and Navy have a long history together. Since now the schools play in different divisions, so the lacrosse rivalry doesn't continue, and in honor of that, I won't mention which school had won the annual lacrosse matchup for five straight years. I will just note that the golf coach here at Annapolis is a Hopkins alum, and when I played golf here last year, he put a Hopkins Blue Jay on my locker, which is probably the first time in the history of Navy athletics one of your varsity lockers was defaced in that way. Now let me also join in welcoming all the students from other schools and from other countries who are here with us this evening. International alliances are critical to global security, and that has never been more true than it is today. So it really is encouraging to see future leaders from different countries here today to learn and to exchange ideas. And more than our countries work together, people work together, and we support one another. And the more peace and prosperous the world will be, the more we do that. I know all of you had a very full day, and I've heard thoughts on leadership from a lot of smart people since I came here. But I thought I would wrap it up by sharing a few of my own leadership thoughts on a practical level that you can use in your military service, your job, and your life. There's 10 of 11 of them. They're simple, but it's what's guided me. Lesson number one. To be honest, here's a picture of me on the day I became an Eagle Scout with my mother and my father and my sister. Family was very important to us. It was the center of our lives. I grew up in a middle-class family in Medford, Massachusetts. And each day at the dinner table, we went around and each of us in turn talked about what we did that day. And then for a few minutes, everybody else would have to discuss it with us. It was the place where my sister and I learned how to present and explain facts, defend our opinions, and answer questions. We also learned that you have to be able to look your loved ones in the eye and tell them, what, tell them what you did that day. If you can't be honest and open with them, you probably shouldn't have done what you didn't tell them. But if you're honest, people will respect you, and they will like you no matter whether they agree with your opinions or not. Lesson number two is don't spend a lot of time making long-term plans. Here's a photo of me, Johns Hopkins University, when I graduated. I never dreamed of going to Hopkins, but I had a job in an electronics company, and my boss suggested I apply. And my time at Hopkins didn't go exactly as I planned. I wanted to be a physics major, but there was a German requirement. This was right after all of the physics had been done in German and had not been translated into English after the war. After three days in German class, I realized that I am not a linguist. I was not going to learn to speak German no matter what happened. So I switched to the engineering school. So it didn't work out the way I'd thought. But then I went to business school, thinking I'd wind up managing a factory. But a friend recommended I try Wall Street, even though I knew nothing about finance. And the lesson there is focus mostly on now. You can't predict what's going to happen. Don't even think about tomorrow until it comes. 
Spend the time where you are right now learning as much as you can and making as many friends as you can. Don't worry about the planning for later. Number three, I taught myself to be the first in and the first out. At business school, I had to pay room, board, and tuition, and so I took a job renting apartments in a real estate office. None of the other salesmen understood why every client who came in had an appointment to see me. It was really very simple. I got in first, about six in the morning, and I answered all the overnight inquiries. And this photo shows me later on at Solomon Brothers, where I worked. I always tried to be the first one there and the last one out at night. In the morning when the managing partner wanted to borrow a match to light his cigar or wanted to talk, sp talk sports, I was the only one he could talk to, so we became friends. And at the end of the day, the number two guy was the last one to leave. What was he going to do, refuse to share an elevator and a subway car with me? So we became friends then. And to this day, I have always believed that a lot of people are smarter than me, and they can do things I can't do, but they cannot outwork me. I can work 24-7, and they can't work more than that. The longer you work, the luckier you get, and the more successful you're going to be. And the more successful you're gonna, you are, the more you are going to want to work. Number four is don't let failure get you down. Take risks. You're not going to get to the top unless you do. And this photo shows me the day we started my company. How did I go to work at Solomon Brothers to start a company? Simple. I got fired. And when you get fired, this opportunities open up. And people are afraid to say, oh, I got fired. I was proud to getting fired. I'd never been fired before. It was wonderful to learn what it felt like. <laughs> now, I don't want to do it a second time. And since my name is on the door of my company, I don't think that's going to happen. But nevertheless, I love my job. And the people that hired me and fired me were great people. And they all became Bloomberg customers. That proves there is a God. <laughs> but after leaving, I had a crazy idea, and I went for it. I started my own company. But if I hadn't gotten fired, I never would have started the company, run for mayor, or been invited to speak to you today. So always look at the bright side. Failure may be embarrassing at first, but it's how you grow. The lesson is you've got to believe. You've got to take risks. You cannot spend your life on the bunny slopes. And you can't read a book about skiing and go out and ski double black diamonds. You have to learn by doing and falling down. Number five lesson is always hire people smarter than you, because you can only do as well as your team does. After the first 100 days in office, and this was where my, my inside team in City Hall, the press kept asking me, what did you do in the first 100 days? And I said, I built a team. And they said, yeah, yeah, but what did you do? I said, no, no, I built a team. And we went back and forth. They couldn't understand that the team was everything. And my team stayed with me for 12 whole years in a business where nobody stays in a government position for more than a year or two. But the team that I put together was the one that made New York City much greater than it was before. What I did is I picked them, I put them together, and if they had a problem, I could adjudicate between disagreements and find a ways to pay them. But they were the ones that were really doing it. So never be afraid to hire somebody smarter than you. They will make you look good. And give credit to them. When I say, no, I didn't do it, Sally did it, two things are true. Number one, everybody knows that I did it. And number two, they respect me more because of it, and Sally respects me. And now Sally's going to want to be part of the team for a longer time, so give credit to others. No matter how annoying it is, lesson number six is you've got to get help, and that means including others. Life really is a two-way street. I don't know anything we do by ourselves. Everything requires other people. This was City Hall. There I am sitting in the middle. Um, Solomon Brothers had an open office, so I, no walls or gates, and I brought that from Bloomberg to City Hall. Openness, I've always thought, improves communications, it builds a sense of team, it builds a sense of trust, and it eliminates leaks. We had virtually no leaks over 12 years, which is just unheard of in government. And when I returned to Bloomberg after City Hall, I found, much to my surprise, that after all my instructions that I had left 12 years earlier, 
that there were not to be any private offices. People said we didn't have any private offices, but all the 12 senior people had conference rooms right next to their desk with the family pictures in them. Needless to say, the next Monday when they came in, the walls were gone. Walls are one of the worst things you can have. They keep people from communicating. And if you want to set an example, people have to be able to see you. The more you break down the walls, the stronger your team's going to be. And if you put yourself right in the middle of all the people you work with, you'll be shocked at just how much better informed you are, how much more they will love you, and how much more you will all do together. Number seven is loyalty goes both ways. You got to stand behind your team during tough times. Give them credit generously. And here's me on a couple of paper, New York City newspaper um, uh, covers. Uh, these are two of the nicer covers, actually. Uh, New York Press is unforgiving and not just of the mayor. I told my commissioners one time that the surest way to keep their secure, job security was for the New York use, newspapers to call and demand that I fired them. Unfortunately, some of them tested that, but nevertheless, I stuck by it. If you don't back the people, they won't take risks. If you don't share credit, they won't be motivated. And the job of the leader is to take the heat and to stand by the people, hold them accountable, but back them up when they take well-considered risks that don't work out. If somebody on your team has an idea that doesn't work, do what I do. I always make sure people understand that I am still supporting them. We'll walk down the hall and on a slightly loud voice will say, oh yes, by the way, when you and your spouse are coming over for dinner tomorrow night, I don't want them for dinner, and I didn't even invite them to dinner. But everybody thinks that, understands that I'm not walking away from them when they did something that didn't work out. Because for all I know, I would not have done a better job. The next one is number eight. Never ask somebody to do something you wouldn't do and, or will, haven't done already. New York City's mass transit system is one of the things that makes New York City great. I'm sure to ride, I was sure to ride the subway virtually every day, especially when there were concerns for security. Whenever there was a terrorist threat against the city or the subway, I made sure everyone could see me riding the subway, helping other people to get on and off, and no, teaching them that it was safe to go about their lives. Same thing at the front gate to City Hall. We had magnetometers, and everybody had to go through the magnetometers. And I was the mayor. And I'd show up, and the cops would say, oh, you don't have to go through the magnetometers. If I ask you to go through them, I'm going through them. And that's a good lesson for all of us. You have, if you're going to ask somebody to do something, do it yourself. I have the same size desk in my company that everybody else does. I wear a name badge the same way everybody else does. I go through any magnetometer we have. If you do it, they will do it. Lead by example. If you want people to do it, that's the ways. Number nine, all important. This is me with some of New York City's religious leaders from different faiths. And I know you know who the green lady is in the background. It's perhaps the most famous piece of public art ever. There was a public uproar over a proposal to build a mosque near Ground Zero by the World Trade Center. Uh, about two years after 9-11. Some thought it was disrespectful to people who lost their lives on 9-11. But remember, Muslims also died on 9-11. Muslims risked their lives to protect us as members of the armed forces. And most importantly, Muslims are Americans with the same rights as everyone else. No one was standing up for their rights and their principles to make America great, so I did. And the lesson here is say what you believe, even if it is unpopular. Stand up for the principles that you believe. Don't get trapped into going along and getting along. The worst thing you can do is lose a battle and look back and say you compromise your values as well. Incidentally, later on, it turned out very popular. Number 10 is give back. No matter how unthinkable it is, someday you may be on the other end. This is a photo of a little girl in Vietnam wearing helmets that my foundation purchased for as many people as we could in the country. Everybody rides bicycles there. There's no automobiles, a few motor scooters, but mostly bicycles. And they fall off, and of course, they get hurt. We fought the Vietnamese, but today they're our allies. Road clash crashes kill more than a million people a year around the world, and these deaths are preventable. And I think we all have a responsibility to do something. 
So we went to Vietnam. It was a manageable sized country. The government was willing to work with us, and we tried to give back and do to them what I hope someday does for us. I learned about giving back from my parents. I'll never forget my father making out a check to the NAACP because he told me discrimination against anyone is a threat to everyone. And I always say the ultimate in financial planning is to bounce the check to the undertaker. But why not give your money away when you have it? Or if you don't have money, give your time. Just try to help others. Someday you really may need the help. And giving back, I can tell you, is one of the most rewarding things that you can do in your life. And everyone can do it, no matter what their means. Number 11 is don't take yourself too seriously. This is me riding a donkey through a midtown hotel dressed in a suit of medieval armor. Why? Well, every year we used to put on a show for the City Hall Press Corps and went all in. I took class, dancing classes with Broadway stars. That was the best part of it, best part of being mayor. Even though I'm no dancer, the point was not to show off, but to show our talents and to have some fun. And it helped establish a good relationship with the press and blow off a little steam. But mainly, it was a lesson to me and for anybody that does it. If you take yourself seriously, you just aren't going to make it, folks. You've got to have a little humor. You've got to realize that you're human. You've got to realize that not everything's going to work. And you've got to realize that most people don't care. They have their own lives. They want you to have your life. And so try to help others and put a smile on your face. Life is just, just too short not to. So there you have it, my few lessons for what I've learned over the years. I'm going to take some questions, but first I just wanted to say to all of the midshipmen and everyone here from the other service academies or in ROTC programs, thank you for serving our country. Over the decade, people who put their lives on the line for our country don't always get the respect and gratitude that they deserve. I, for one, after 76 years, have learned to have a tremendous amount of respect for all of you and everything you're doing. It really talks about character. If you're willing to come here, you're willing to dedicate yourself to keep our country safe and make it better. We are all lucky to have you. Thank you very much, and we'll take a few questions. Stand up here. Gotcha. Mr. Bloomberg, uh, so there's been some discussion recently about whether education is a strong link or weak link problem, like whether putting money at the very top at the best schools is more important than putting money at the bottom for maybe some schools that aren't quite as talented. Um, so given this, can you talk about your decision to give your $1.8 billion to a really strong link like Johns Hopkins as opposed to maybe somewhere not as strong like UMBC or something like that? Um, I think there's two kinds of schools, and then there's schools that do both. There are schools where the objective is to educate people, to be well-rounded, and to have the skills to get a job, keep the job, and enjoy the great American dream. And then there are schools whose primary purpose is research. They're the ones that are going to cure cancer and invent the transistor and do all of the things that we need for the future. And some schools do both. Johns Hopkins, my uh, alma mater, I think tries to do both. There's no question it's one of the top universities, and I'd like to see it be at the top and try to help to do that. Uh, but we have an enormously strong research area, research departments. I also want to make sure that kids who are really smart and can deal in that high-powered academic level, at that high-powered academic level, can afford to go. And so I gave money so that with the in an endowment, so that Johns Hopkins can be need blind for anybody that has the academic credentials to get in, but does not have the financial wherewithal to pay room, board, and tuition. When I went to Johns Hopkins in 1960, my parents took an extra mortgage out on the house uh, to help my sister and me. I had a job after school for three of the four years I was in college, and I worked every summer to pay for the same thing through graduate school. I did not have any scholarships because in those days, 
scholarships were not given out on the basis of need, they were given out on the basis of academic achievement. And as I told you, my record would not get me any of that kind of money. So I think you can make the case that we can find a ways to pay for schools at all levels. I can't take care of the entire world or the entire country, but I can take care of the school that gave me an opportunity and a school that I'm so proud of, of what it gives back to educating kids and to doing research. And incidentally, Johns Hopkins does an awful lot of work in the Baltimore community with junior colleges, with specialty colleges, and with those that where the academic rigor is not quite up to the standard of Hopkins, but where people want to get a good education. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Sir, Midshipman First Class McNamara, would uh, you be able to speak on some of the leadership challenges you faced in expanding the NYPD in the post-9-11 era? Um, New York City has been blessed with a police department that has an enviable record. If you plot all of the major cities in America in terms of, with time, how many cops pull a gun or fire a gun or make a mistake or whatever, they all sort of go together. If you look carefully at that graph, you will see a straight line at the x-axis in the bottom. That's New York. New York has so few murders, the police make so few mistakes that you can't put it on the same graph with all of the other major cities, any of the other major cities in America. And I've always thought it is because of a very well-trained sergeant level in the police department. In the NYPD, it's the sergeants that are at the site. That's the officer that says, stop, go, fire, don't fire, cuff them, don't cuff them, walk away, whatever that sergeant thinks is the right thing to do. And the training of the PD is they follow the sergeants. And I think it's not the lieutenant and captain and chief level that makes the difference, so they'll shoot me for saying this, but it's at the sergeant level where the action takes place, out at the site of the event, the crime, the disruption, or whatever the case may be. It has a long tradition of uh, being in, uh, it's, it's been in existence for longer than most police departments. It is very big, uh, very expensive, and very diverse. And we've always tried to see if one-tenth of one percent of the citizens of New York City were born in Cairo, one-tenth of one percent of the police department will have been born in Cairo. So you may not see a cop that stops you or that you interface with that has, comes from your background, but you know somebody in the police department comes from your background. And so the relationship between the police and the public is as good, if not better, than any city I have ever seen. Thank you, sir. Good evening, sir. My name is Daniel Moriarty. I'm a second class in Fifth Company. In your third point tonight, you talked about how you would be the first in and the last out, how they, you would work harder than anyone else in your company. This and many other points are very similar to our ideals here that we believe in as future, ide future leaders of sailors and Marines. Part of this is finding your own reason why, and this reason will bring you through the tough times in life. What brings you to work so hard, sir, and how can we use these reasons to develop our own service to the nation? Well, I like what I do. I've always liked what I did. Um, I was once at a dinner party where somebody said, what's the worst job you ever had? And I couldn't answer it because I never had a bad job. Um, what's the worst day you've ever had, was asked. I've had two bad days in my life, the day my father died and the day my mother died. And I don't know what 365 times 76 is, but there's a lot of other days. And every one of them I look forward to. I know tomorrow's going to be a better day than today, and it's kind of hard to top today. Um, if you like what you do, you will do more of it and you will do better and you'll be rewarded more, giving you more reason to like it. If, on the other hand, you don't like what you do, then you're gonna do less 
people will respect you less, you'll have less opportunity, and you're going to spiral down rather than spiral up. So I think a lot of it is the attitude of going in. There's got to be some good in everything. And yeah, there are some times it's annoying, everybody's banging on your head, and you said the wrong thing, and the food was terrible, and your kids came home with green hair or something. But generally, it's pretty hard when you look at how lucky we are here in America to turn and say, this is bad. I just think you have to convince yourself that God has been awful good to all of us and enjoy it. And then you'll go out and do more of it. And you'll like it better and you'll be luckier. So it's uh, convincing yourself. It's, it's uh, looking in a mirror and not seeing something bad. You know, I want to walk out. Of, when I was mayor, sometimes I'd read the newspapers before I left and I'd walk out and want to slam my fist into a lamppost. But it was never what somebody else said about me. It was, I said something I shouldn't have, or I went someplace I shouldn't have, or didn't go someplace. I only cared about whether I made a mistake or not. If they criticize me, let them criticize me. In the end, I'm going to be just fine, and I hope they are too, but I don't care. You know, just go and enjoy yourself and convince yourself and your family we are very lucky people. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being here today, Mr. Bloomberg. Um, I'm Sammy Shu, a public health student at Case Western Reserve University. And I was wondering um, what you think is one of the biggest challenges in public health. What are you doing about it? And what can we as students do to contribute? Well, public health is, and comprises a lot of things. I think um, maybe you could argue climate change is public health. Climate change has the potential to destroy all living human beings. And if that isn't something to worry about, I don't know what is. Um, in public health, there is obesity and smoking um, and drugs. And uh, for the first time in the history of the world, more people are dying from communicable diseases than from non-communicable diseases. A communicable disease is something where your lifestyle causes something to happen, whereas a non-communicable disease, you've just inherited it and there's not a lot you can do about it. Um, I'm, at Johns Hopkins, I got interested in public health when the head of the uh, School of Public Health um, tried to convince me, and he did, that it would be a lot more, uh, a lot easier, a lot more economical, and a lot uh, uh, nicer, if you will, to prevent people from getting sick than to cure them after they were sick. And today, the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins is named the Bloomberg School of Public Health, and. Last year, my foundation gave away $700-odd million, of which the biggest chunk went to public health issues. We do things around the world. We work on uh, things like malaria and cancer and smoking I talked about. Uh, we work on trying to find out what people in uh, Africa are dying from, because if you want to help people, you've got to know what they're dying from, and there's no good records. Uh, we have in uh, Tanzania, uh, a program where we train high school graduates to perform appendectomies and um, cesareans. It turns out in Tanzania there are 50,000 people per doctor. In the United States it's 500 people per doctor. So in Tanzania there are no doctors. If you need an appendectomy or a cesarean and you don't get it, you die. So you can't, if you don't have this, if you have anything less than a 100% fatality rate, you really can make a difference. And it turns out those are two operations that are relatively simple. If there is a real complication, the patient dies, no argument about that. But most of the patients, you save their lives. And it's been a very successful program, and I think it shows you can do things thinking outside the box, trying new things, and trying to tailor things in public health to the, where you're delivering the services. We have a different kind of problem in America, for example. Last year, in 2017, uh, 72,000 Americans OD'd on drugs. In 2018, uh, more people than that are ODing on drugs, have OD'd on drugs. And today, incidentally, we are trying to legalize another addictive narcotic, which is perhaps the stupidest thing anybody's ever done. 
we've got to fight that. And that's another thing that Bloomberg Philanthropies will work on in public health. Thank you. Uh, hi, Mr. Bloomberg. Uh, Ruben Morris here, St. John's College. And uh, I have two quick questions. Uh, the first is, so in recent years, recent decades, you've seen huge influx of money into New York City in particular. Uh, I, I've, I've seen this to some extent myself uh, growing up there. I was in, in Brooklyn. My family moved out a little while later. It got real expensive. And that's, there's this trend of that throughout the city. And uh, so obviously, there's foundations like yours, which are helping get money back to places where it need, it's needed, but there's still this massive inequality. So how does that affect who the leaders are gonna be? Uh, are we in a condition where we, we're gonna see growing aristocracy because of that, or is there hope uh, in terms of? I couldn't quite hear the question. Are we talking about the oh, money sorry. coming into New York and then? Yeah, 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 no, I, how do we avoid uh, the leaders of the next generation coming exclusively from wealthier backgrounds, places where all the money is. Well, I don't is, think there's you know. any evidence that yeah. uh, if you take a look at the past presidents, uh -huh. uh, Obama certainly didn't come from any money. Yeah. Bush, I suppose, did. Mm -hmm. um, but to go back, Lyndon Johnson didn't. Kennedy did. Nixon, probably not a lot. Um, you know, money is one of the things, but the public doesn't necessarily look at your income statement or balance sheet. Um, sometimes they look at whether they like what the, your looks, they like whether you speak well. Sometimes, surprise, surprise, they even look at whether you can do the job. <laughs> Not often, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think money is overrated in terms of politics, and it turns out that in spite of everybody yelling and screaming about too much money in government, it is the Democratic Party in the last few years that has raised a lot more money than the Republicans true, have. Yeah. Exactly the reverse of what you would believe if you listen to them crying poverty and saying big money is wrong, and then they go out and solicit big money. Yeah. And so uh, I, I'm not sure that, uh, I, I think what you've got to ask yourself is, on what is the purpose of an election? If an election is to give everybody the opportunity to speak and to express themselves, then you want to have everybody vote, whether they can read or write, whether they've read history and had a civics class, whether they're 12 years old and have any maturity or not. Another way to look at elections is if the purpose is to select the, per the person with the best qualifications to do the job, then you would change the system from what we have. You would have criteria before you can present yourself in a competitive democratic race, have to show that you have a PhD, you run five companies, won a Nobel Prize, that kind of stuff. And so we as a society, I ha think, have to decide what are we trying to do? Now, nobody wants to talk about that. And the press has, because of social media, and the changing economics of the news business focused on clicks and eyeballs and anything that's sensationalist they put on the front page and if it's not, if it requires some thought and explanation, if they print it at all, it gets buried way in the back. And in fact, the news used to be selected by people who have experience in a lot of different things can put things in context and uh, uh, explain them. And they were the ones that picked which stories go on the front page or lead in the radio and television business or whatever. Today, we do that by crowdsourcing. And if you believe that the public likes sex and scandal and embarrassment and failure and sports, you could expect everything to be dumbing down, and that's exactly what's happening. And we've, it's a serious problem. So, 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 so uh, yes, we, we had. We, sorry, good time. For one for each of you. Good evening, sir. Um, I'm a shipman first class. Amanda Ghana from Fourth Company. Uh, sir, earlier you said that discrimination to one is a threat to everyone, but there have been a lot of controversy surrounding your support of the policy stop and frisk. Um, that was mainly used by law enforcement to target African-Americans and Hispanic-Americans. Um, 
standing up here today, what would you say to those um, in the two communities that have been negatively affected by this policy that you supported in the past? Well, we certainly did not pick somebody by race. What the way stop and frisk worked was that you went to a place where there was somebody who had been murdered and in that place or recently in that place and that's where you looked for kids that looked like they might have a gun. What we did was we focused on fighting the NRA, we focused on keeping kids from going through the correctional system where they just came out worse than they went in. Kids who walked around looking like they had a gun removed the gun from their pockets to stop it. And the result of that was over the years, the murder rate in New York City went from 650 a year down to 300 a year when I left. If you do the math, it's something like 1,600 people, an awful lot of them young male minorities, a lot of them just grandmothers and grandfathers and five-year-old kids sitting on a doorstep that were getting shot when the bullets started flying around. And I think what you have to decide is, what's the most, what are you trying to do? We have to stop the carnage in some neighborhoods, not all neighborhoods. Typically, you will find all of the problems in neighborhoods where the schools are very bad and the kids do not get an education and don't think they have an opportunity. And they start getting in with the wrong crowd, winding up with guns, dealing drugs, and things like that. You have to stop that if we are going to ever end poverty and give all people in America an, the opportunity to enjoy the great things, to have a career, to be in charge of their own destinies. And uh, it was a program which we had, and then when it, the number of guns we uh, were confiscating started to fall, when people left their guns at home, we tailed that off. And I think it's also true that most police departments around the world do the same thing, they just don't report it or use the terminology. But it's, it, it is, the, the, the effect of what we did and what I've continued to do since I've gotten out of City Hall, fight the NRA, go around this country lobbying and spending a lot of money to elect pro-gun uh, background check candidates, and it has been successful, and we're starting even in Maryland with a Republican governor Maryland has been very progressive in passing some gun laws, as they did in Florida, another state with a Republican governor, uh, passing ch background checks so that you don't sell guns to minors, you don't sell guns to people with psychiatric problems, and you don't sell guns to people with criminal records. So thank you. Thank you, sir. That's it. Good evening, Mr. Bloomberg. My name is Holly Rose. I'm a student at Case Western Reserve University. Um, something that really struck me as a college student is that going to an institution that is super diverse in terms of backgrounds and ethnicities, however, it's very homogenous with regards to academic opportunities up until college. And while not every successful person came from money, it seems that financial security definitely bolsters your opportunities in the future. So how do you suggest, other than providing money to students who have already reached those opportunities, ways to ensure educational accessibility and economic mobility? Well, Bloomberg Philanthropy sponsors two organizations, one of which is made up of 100 plus uh, colleges and universities who are looking for diversity and they're having trouble finding students who give them the diversity they want but have the academic credentials to compete in their school or university. On the other side, we have a organization where we tutor and then act as guidance counselor for students who have shown great academic progress, but come from neighborhoods, schools, where they would never think of applying to that first group of schools. Their guidance counselor would never send them there. There's one guidance counselor for a thousand students who will send them to a local community college even when these are people who could do graduate level work. And so we try to work on the supply as well as the demand and match them together. I think another answer to your question is we don't provide good public schools in this country in most cases. 
The school systems keep getting dumbed down year after year after year in a world where the value of education and the requirement for education is going up and up and up. And so you are never going to end poverty unless we do something about this. And unfortunately, we start at the beginning. If you don't get a good education in grades one through six, let's say, you're not going to do very well in grades seven through nine, and then 10 through 12. And then if you could get into a school, you're still not going to do well there, or even get out and get, get a diploma and get out and get a job. You have to start at the beginning. You have to teach people how to read, how to write, how to get along with other people, how to speak good English. This is an English-speaking country. If you don't have good English, if you can't do the math, if you can't read, if you can't write, you do not have a future, unfortunately. And we are sitting around letting, year after year, students go into the system and never come out with the skills they need at the other end. It really is a disgrace. Thank you. Okay, last question, because we do have to go. Good evening, sir. My name is Mitch Jim and Nathan Lee from the 29th Company. My question is, sir, you mentioned your philanthropy work in Vietnam. How did you transcend the cultural differences to provide the necessary aid? Well, philanthropy is difficult uh, to do it worldwide. Uh, if you could talk to Gates, he'd tell you the same thing we experienced. Uh, we do a lot of work with the Gates Foundation. One of the things is trying to eradicate polio. And you can eradicate polio, you just have to give vaccines every place. And there are countries that don't want you to give vaccines to their people, even though they're going to die. So in some places, for example, Europe, there's a big group of people that think that private philanthropy is wrong. The government should do those things. Well, the government's not doing them. And so to withhold private philanthropy because of the argument that down the road, it would be better to have everybody suffer and then demand that the government take over the responsibilities that are being currently fulfilled by private philanthropy, to me doesn't make any sense. America does have a tradition of private philanthropy. It tends to be in the bigger cities, although that's where people with wealth tend to congregate, and they're the ones that can make the gifts you read about. But most of charity in America is very small donations, an awful lot of it to your church, synagogue, temple, mosque, or whatever. Um, philanthropy is um, you can waste your money, uh, or you can give it to somebody else to do the right thing with it, or you can, if you're big enough, have your own organization, and you yourself can get involved. Uh, one of my daughters has her own charity. Uh, she's a professional horseback rider, and she takes care of kids uh, who are, uh, uh, have uh, physical problems, and they can compete. I was sitting with one of them the other night. She's competing in the Paralympics, uh, and Georgina, my daughter, funds her and some others who are training. Um, Georgina has another charity where uh, kids who uh, can't even get to that level uh, go when they just get led around on horses and it's the best thing in their day. Uh, my other daughter has her own charity, nonprofit. Uh, she works on people who want to reform the school system through electing pro reform city council and school board members. And so she helps you find uh, candidates and raise money and get lawyers who work pro bono and that sort of thing. So you can do it without any money. Uh, you just have to, I think, come from a family where it's tradition. And I've always criticized a lot of uh, college athletes who go to school, build a career, go into the pros, make a lot of money, and don't give back a lot of money to their schools. And I think the problem is not so much that they're bad people, they just don't come from families where philanthropy was a tradition. And in my case, yeah, I sold Boy Scout wreaths and gave the money to somebody, I forget who. Uh, my mother collected for some of the local charities. My father wrote some checks. He didn't have a lot of money, but we supported <coughs> some things. Uh, philanthropy can give you an enormous amount of pleasure, but you've got to know about it. And I think in all fairness, outside of America, it's a struggle. I also happen to be chair of a, uh, an art museum in London, and raising money for it is not 
easy in London. We raise a lot of money for the London Art Museum in America, where it's a lot easier to raise that money than it is over the other side of the ocean, where they're going to go to the museum. And it's still hard to raise money from them. Anyways, let me just uh, finish by saying thank you for having me. It is a great honor in my life. Uh, I will think about this night for a very long time. I'm an envy of all of you for dedicating your lives to keep this country safe. So on behalf of uh, my girlfriend and my former wife and my kids and my grandkids, thank you all and good evening. Sir, we'd like to thank you for your remarks tonight. And the, on behalf of the Brigade of Midshipmen, we'd like to present you this gift. Oh. So they get very excited, sir. Thank you. Thank you.